Praise the Lord. God bless you all. We thank God for allowing us to be here today. For his love, his mercy, his goodness, his greatness, his graciousness. That he blesses us and he gives us strength to do his mighty and perfect and glorious will. Praise the Lord. Here we are on a Thursday night, praising the Lord and thanking him for all that he allows us to do, for the fact that he's with us. Um, whatever things come against us, get us down, disappointments, um, disrespect, uh, things that that seem to be going wrong, even though we're trying to do everything right, we understand that the Lord is with us. And we have to stand, um, we're going to speak about that when we come to it, we have to stand in the grace and the knowledge that the Lord provides for us, understanding that the Lord loves us, the Lord is for us, the Lord is going to bless us, and the Lord is blessing us, that those who have decided to oppose the Lord at some point will see the error of their ways. Will they repent? I don't know. That depends on, on uh, their individual decisions and also if the Spirit of God allows them to come uh, to repentance. And so we need to be sure that we are standing in the right location, that we are doing the things of God, that we are honoring the Lord in the way we speak and think and act, and that uh, we are surely doing what pleases Him. So God bless you. I see there's a few of you on. Can you please let me know if you can both hear and see me so that I can know that um, all this technology is working uh, correctly. Praise the Lord. God bless you, Eddie. Good to see you there. Um, as I said, please someone let me know if you're able to see me and hear me so that I can know that all of this is working well. We continue to praise the Lord because God is good. The Bible is clear that God is on his throne. It doesn't matter how things look because we're always going to see things with our flesh eyes, right? We, we only have these eyes of flesh unless the Lord opens our spiritual eyes and we're able to see other things. So we need to know that God is on his throne because the word of God, the Bible says that he is. And so we honor him. We praise him. We thank him because we, we recognize that in this world, we're going to be opposed. There's going to be a lot of opposition. There's going to be contrary spirits. Um, something that, that does occur and we may not understand. Some people will come against you and you don't understand why they're coming against you. Well, it is because you guys don't have the same spirit. That's it. Your spirits are opposed to each other. There's a battle. There's a, there's a war being waged. And you need to know that you are on the right side because ultimately, God is going to win. Thank you, Eddie, for letting me know. I've also posted some some uh, some words there, some questions, or well, one question and several words um, that we're going to be covering as we get into the Bible study. So I'm going to give a moment for people to come on in uh, and join us tonight. I'm excited about tonight. We're going to be speaking about the armor of God, uh, something that, that we all need. We all need to be protected by the power uh, of God. So we need to know that the Lord is with us, that the Lord loves us, that the Lord is gracious, that the Lord is good. Uh, that the Lord wants good for us, we will choose if we are going to be on the Lord's side or, or some other side. But the bottom line is this. Uh, the Bible is clear that God wants us to honor him, to love him, to serve him, and he wants good things for us. I'm reminded of a verse that I, I have read several times in the past and I came across it, uh, uh, um, it today. Isaiah chapter 48, 17 says that God, the Holy One, the Redeemer of Israel, it is he who teaches us to profit. Another version says, it is he who teaches us the direction that we should walk, where we should go, how we should plan our days, how we should live our lives. So Isaiah 48, 17 is letting us know that God is in the business of directing our steps when and if we seek him. Now, if we don't seek him, well, God is still there and we're still here, but there's very little communication going on. So it is important that we are able to keep a constant communication um, with the Lord. So praise God. So we praise the Lord and we thank him because he is good and his mercy is forever. God bless you, Maria. I see you there. So let's see if anybody else is on. If anybody else is on, please let me know that you are here. Um, praise the Lord so that we can um, move on. So as I said before and I shared uh, in the post that, that I uh, sent out a little earlier today, we are going to be speaking about the armor of God today. This is something that the Lord has prepared for us to equip us to be able to withstand, as the Bible says, in the evil day. And what's the evil day? <laughs> the evil day is every day that you and I live in this world. But also, it is very specific in speaking about those days in which you feel most harassed, you feel most tired, 
you feel most that things are coming against you. Uh, maybe there's something going on in, in, in your home. Maybe there's something going on in your job. Maybe something's happening in someone's church. Uh, maybe in your community. Um, we see the upheaval that continues uh, to come against the, uh, against the world, basically. But also, we need to understand that people are choosing, are choosing to do evil things. And then there are consequences to the actions. God has prepared a remedy for us to be prepared when the evil day comes so that we will be strong, so that we will be able to stand and we will be blessed by the Lord as he strengthens us. I got to tell you, if the Lord is not with you, well, that means that the Lord is, opposes you. Whoever God opposes will not prosper. I don't care if they have a billion dollars in the bank account, because the way we look at things is, if a person is doing well, they have money, they have cars, they have apartments, they have this, they have that, they're doing well. No, 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 don't, don't get it wrong. I, I love how Patterson used to say, don't get it twisted. We look only at the physical. God is looking internally also. Physical is fine, but God is looking internally also. What is going on inside of that person? What spirit is revolving inside of them? So you and I might come across people that we think they got it all going on. And the reality is that there's turmoil inside of them. There's double-mindedness. There's mental illness there. Now, mental illness, I, I would not never say that that comes from demonic presences, but it can. And this is where we need to be prayed up. On this particular class that I'm taking on trauma, one of the uh, authors and one of the speakers talks about altars, A-L-T-E-R-S, not altars that are built for sacrifices, but altars, different personalities inside of an individual. And he begins speaking on how he has worked with people that have different personalities at different times, and sometimes they even name them. And he says that there's a touch of the demonic there. Why? Because they have been broken. Something inside of them has snapped. It may even be that they are protecting themselves from something uh, that has come in and hurt them. Now, on the other hand, it could also be that they are doing like the prodigal son who decided that he wanted his father dead and said, give me my inheritance. And his father gave it to him. Then the Bible says later on, when he came to his senses, you and I know a lot of people that are out of their senses right now. We need to pray that they come back to their senses before something bad happens to them. And that is why the Lord has given us the whole armor of God so that we will be able to withstand on the evil day. God bless you, Patricia. I'm glad you made it. Um, there, guys, I saved you a seat right in the front row, okay? So you don't, you don't have to uh, be concerned about being able to see me uh, close up. <laughs> but praise the Lord. Let's pray, and we're going to get on with this Bible study. We thank you, Father, for your love and your mercy, your goodness, because you're wonderful, my God. Because you keep us, my God, in the face of adversity. Because your blessing is with us regardless of the circumstances in which we live. Father, because you strengthen us day after day after day. And then when all our days are done, you're going to take us to rest with you. So I thank you, my Lord, for this evening. I thank you for those that have made it online, for those that are going to join a little bit later. Um, my Lord, I ask that you bless them, that you help them. If they have the intention of coming in, that they would come in. Uh, and that we would have a blessed time in your presence, my Lord. Lead us by your Holy Spirit. You know full well all the battles that we have, the things that concern us, my God, the things that pick us up and the things that knock us down. So I ask that right now you give us strength to be able to do your will. In your name, Lord Jesus. Amen, Lord, and amen. So God bless you all. Please turn in your Bibles. You're going to turn to two different sections. So first, turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. I'll give you a moment to get there. Ephesians chapter 6. So go there. Ephesians chapter 6. And then you're going to turn to the book of Isaiah also. And you will be in Isaiah chapter 59. Again, Ephesians chapter 6. That's in the New Testament. And then Isaiah chapter 59 in the Old Testament. Okay, so in Ephesians chapter 6, we've got to begin um, with verse 10. And there, what um, the Apostle Paul is talking about is the whole armor of God. There's an armor that God has prepared for us to wear. Now, that armor 
is of course it's something that protects it helps us think of think of iron man he has a suit that protects him from head to toe right there's no area of his body that's not protected well we have the whole armor of god and then the apostle paul breaks it down to its different levels and even to the different parts of the armor so that we can have an understanding of what it means now we have to know that this is a metaphor right he's making an analogy of god's protection through this armor i know some people because i've heard them speak uh, of this that they'll get up in the morning and they'll put on the whole armor of god and, and they'll go through the motions of doing all those things good if that helps you remember on um, what each part is that's fine do that but you have to keep in mind that you cannot take this literally in the sense that you are protected by this type of thing in every situation what it means is that we walk with these things that God has provided for us, these resources, um, God's blessing, of course, part of that, to keep us safe in the evil day. So that's Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10. So keep your finger there and now turn to Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah chapter 59. And I want to just give you a little um, background before we get into the study in Ephesians um, 6. When the Bible says that this is the armor of God, of course, it's a provision from God. Isaiah chapter 59 is talking about the fact that Israel, the nation of Israel, they continue to sin. And very often they move far away from God. And so they receive the just punishment, the consequences of their sin. Now, when, I don't, we don't like hearing about that. There are consequences to our behavior. Unfortunately, now in society, um, even laws are being passed where it limits consequences for negative behavior. And if you're a law-abiding citizen, you might feel um, that that's, that's wrong because we suffer. When we seek to do what is right and people who are doing wrong seem to get away with it. Now, in this world, they're going to get away with it. Eventually, God is going to do complete justice. It's going to be an incredible justice. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is going to reign with a rod of iron. In other words, nothing will escape his attention. Everything will be brought to a head and we will stand before God. And those who continue to perpetrate evil, whatever level, level they're in, they are going to pay for whatever they have done. So in Isaiah chapter 59, God is speaking to the Israelites. And he's talking about, uh, if you go to verse 13, there's rebellion and treachery against God. The nation turned their back against God. They were being, they were, it says here in the, in the NIV, they were fomenting oppression and revolt. It sounds kind of uh, um, like something that's happening in society today. They, uh, they were uttering lies that they themselves had given birth to and then they, they will repeat them. So they were suffering also because of their own sin. And then what happens? It says here, justice is driven back and righteousness stands at a distance. Truth has stumbled in the streets. Honesty cannot enter. Truth is nowhere to be found. And whoever shuns evil becomes a prey. It sounds like today. The law abiding citizens who hate evil, who shun evil, are the ones that are suffering the consequences because the evildoers are freely walking down the street. And they're enjoying the fact that they have a lot of freedom that if they were incarcerated, they're going to come right back out. Now, I know that's a political statement. There it is. So what happened? Verse 16. Sorry, verse 15. The second part. The Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. Could you imagine? When we see people getting injured in the streets and people pull out their, 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 their phones and they begin recording it and laughing at it, but do nothing to stop it. This is the society in which you and I live today. So God was appalled. So his own arm worked salvation for him and his own righteousness sustained him. Marcos, I know you just came in. So we are speaking on Isaiah chapter 59 right now, beginning in verse, uh, we spoke a couple of verses, but now we're going to go to verse 17. Isaiah 59, 17, and then Ephesians chapter 6. So what did God do? Remember, in Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to talk about the whole armor of God. But here, 
Listen to what it says. Verse 17 of Isaiah chapter 59. God put on righteousness as his breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. And then it says, according to what they have done, so will he repay wrath to his enemies and retribution to his foes. Let's not get it wrong. If you believe that everybody's going to heaven, you are not believing what the Bible says. Some people are going to suffer the wrath of God for no other reason that they have chosen to oppose God. And here it is speaking about the fact that God is going to wear this armor. Again, that's a metaphor for his acts of righteousness against those that continue to do evil. So that brings us, we can go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. And here, uh, in Isaiah 59, was the reference for what we're going to see here. The armor of God that Paul breaks down um, for us. And I want us to understand what it means. So I have a couple of, uh, uh, one question and then some, some words that I wrote out here. First question, and I want to see if you guys can answer it. Why is it called the armor of God if we wear it? That's the question. Put the answer in your chat there. Why is it called the armor of God if we wear it? Now, in Isaiah 59, God was wearing it. But here, in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul tells us to wear it. But it's called the armor of God. So what does that mean? I'll give you a moment to respond to that. Good evening, ladies. Praise the Lord. Okay, good. Lillian has a good answer because it is God who is doing the protecting of us. Very good. That's excellent. Um, Lauren says he is our, he's our protection. Absolutely. It is the armor of God in the sense that God has prepared this armor for us to wear. Right? God doesn't have to wear the armor. Now, now as I said before, uh, in, the, um, in Isaiah chapter 59, God is speaking about wearing righteousness and wearing salvation, but that is for our um, benefit. Heidi, I don't know what you mean by what you wrote there. So the armor of God, the armor of God is something that God has prepared for us. Oh, Maria has a good um, reference. She says, it's like a blanket which covers us. Yes, that's very good. It is. A blanket totally covers us, keeps us warm, protects us from the environment, from other critters or stuff that might be around. So it does protect us. Okay, Heidi says the blood of Jesus, but but we can't go too far in the reference because here it's not really going to speak about the blood of Jesus. Although the blood of Jesus does cover us from sin, but here um, it's not speaking about the blood of Jesus. So Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10, says like this. So Paul gives a bunch uh, uh, of uh, examples of what God is doing for us. And he also tells us how to behave. He says that we should obey the people that we work for. He talks about the marriage covenant between husbands and wives. He talks about the fact that children should obey their parents. He talks about all these different things. And then he goes into, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Now, that's important because too many of us are strong in our own power. That's dangerous. We are able to take care of ourselves. And we'll talk about, I don't need anybody. Let me tell you something. You need Jesus. Because when everything comes to a close, at the, the, when you're gasping your last breath, you better be sure that the Lord there is, is there to catch you. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Verse 11, put on the full. So it's not, it doesn't say put on one piece or two pieces. They're, they're, he mentioned six pieces, but put on the full armor of God. Another version of the Bible says put on the whole armor of God. It's not just one or two things. The whole armor of God for what? So that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Now that's really important. You know how many of us, cannot stand against the devil's schemes. There's a bunch of us that can't stand 
against the devil's schemes, his wiles, his tricks. You know why? Because we continually fall for the same old dumb thing. And we're constantly tricked because we give time to hear the devil's nonsense. The more time you give to hear nonsense, the more nonsense you're going to hear. And when we cater to foolish conversations, to gossip and to all those things, guess what? People will say, hey, look at what this person said. When you didn't say it, you were just listening to the conversation, but they will say that you said. Now you've been there and I've been there. You got to be very careful about your conversation. Now, in the Bible, the word conversation doesn't mean just mean your speech. It means your entire conduct. How you live your life is your conversation. So, verse 11 again. Put on the full armor of God or the whole armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. So now Paul is beginning to speak to us about how a soldier operates. So you put on the full armor of God. You got everything. And then you stand. What does that mean? That you are not going to be moved from the location in which you have determined that you're going to stand. Now, that's important for you and for me. Because, for example, I've thought of my job as a school social worker. The Lord gave me that job uh, 1997, March of 1997. I've gone through ups and downs, negative situations, good situations. I've been tired of the job. I love the job. All of those things. But I know that the Lord gave me the job. And so I can stand believing nobody can take that job away from me because God gave it to me. That's important. And you and I need to be able to take a stand in different parts of our lives. We have to be able to say, Lord, I'm going to, st I'm going to stand for this because not standing for it means that I fall for the devil's schemes. So Paul begins by letting us know, have that armor on, have it ready, because the devil is scheming. He's, uh, I love how <laughs> Gollum in the Lord of the Rings, he says, uh, speaking about someone that they're tricksy. They like to play tricks. That's what the devil does. He likes to snare us. He likes to mess with us. He'll come up to us and, and he'll rub against us. right? And you think it's a nice cuddly dog and, and the next thing you know is a snake. This is what he does. And he does it well because he's been training for thousands of years. That's why you and I cannot stand against the devil without the power of God. Don't even think about it. Imagine Adam and Eve in the garden. They had God with them and they still fell because they decided to make foolish decisions. You and I, thank God, have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. But are we listening to his voice? Paul goes on. So he's telling us, make sure you have the whole armor on. So that you can take your stand. In other words, you resist against the devil's schemes. For our struggle, verse 12, is not against flesh and blood. Guess what? You and I are fighting against people. We need to be fighting against what's behind those people, which is satanic power and oppression. It's not the person. It's what's behind the person. The person may not even know that they're being used by the devil. But if you are a Bible-believing Christian and you're standing on the rock that is Jesus, the Lord can give you discernment to see what's behind the scenes. And the Lord, if you get into the Bible, very often shows us what's happening behind the scenes. So what's happening here? Again, verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against your husband. It's not against your wife. It's not against your son. It's not against your daughter. It's not against your boss. Although they may be representative of the evil powers, it is what's moving them behind the scenes, what's pushing them, what's inciting their minds, what's, what's egging them on to be spiteful or hateful or nasty. It's demonic. Now, this is sad, though, when they claim to be servants of God, then that gets really ugly, right? But that's a whole other, uh, whole other session. So we're struggling uh, against flesh and blood. So our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but now he breaks it down. What are we struggling against? We are struggling and we're fighting rulers against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Let's break that down. You and I are struggling, and it really is a cosmic struggle, against 
the elemental forces of this world that we spoke about um, last week in the book of Colossians, those things of this world that raise themselves up against the power of God, these demonic things. Uh, uh, for example, when, when, when someone is doing something evil and they say that it is good, and when you do something good and someone says that it is evil, those are demonic forces at work. Uh, when someone says, "Well, no, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, what I what I was born to be. No, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a dog, or, or I'm a, I'm a horse, or something like that." That's a demonic power operating inside of that person. If they truly believe um, such a thing, now they could be sick, they could be psychotic, they could have some other issues going on. But what we're seeing in society is that people are attributing to themselves things that are not true. And we're going to come to the belt of, truth, uh, belt of truth in a second, but we have to be very careful of not joining that. Now, that means that as Christians, that you and I might be marginalized because we're going to say what you're saying is not true to another individual. And they're going to get offended by that, as so many people are so easily offended. And you might end up in a lawsuit or reprimanded by your boss. So just be prepared. To, if you're going to take a stand, if you take a stand on the word of God. So our struggle, again, I want to reiterate this, is not against flesh and blood. It's not against the people. And we're so foolish that we begin jostling with the person. We get into these, these fights with an individual, not realizing that that's exactly what the enemy wants. Because it's like uh, there's a saying in Spanish, eh? uno tira la piedra y esconde la mano. Uh, it, the translation is this. There are some people who will throw the rock, but then they'll hide their hand. What is it? They incite things, but then they make believe that they don't know what's going on. This is what the devil is doing. He's inciting, even in the church. And he's mobilizing individuals to do what is wrong. And then he sits back and laughs as we, as foolish Christians, engage in useless debates and argue against each other. And what happens? The soul who wanted to come to church to serve God says, I'm not going to hang out with those people. They're worse than I am. This is why you and I need to conduct ourselves as believers of God. And that's very important. Always, always being mindful of those that are around us. So we struggle, not against people, but against these incredibly powerful beings that are out there, spiritual forces that are blinding people's eyes, that are not letting them see the truth. Isaiah chapter 25 says that in the end, God is going to remove the veil from all of the nations. But right now, people are veiled. They cannot discern reality. And as a matter of fact, some people are coddling their, their unreality. They're hiding. They're disassociating. And they're being applauded for their foolish behavior. This is the society in which we live in. So you and I need to be awake, right? We need to take our stand. So what does, it, what does he tell us to do? Because of these forces and because of the devil's schemes, which we already read, verse 13, therefore, because all of these things are happening, because we're fighting against these forces, put on the full armor of God. He already told us that. So that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand. Now, how many times did he tell us to stand? In other words, stop taking things, laying down like it's a minor thing. You know how many people I know in the church that are complacent, they're happy, they're getting fat and sloppy because, and I mean that in a spiritual sense, because, they have decided that reading the Bible is not a big deal. It doesn't really matter. That, that praying is not a big deal. It doesn't really matter. That living a Christian life, oh, it's not, God is going to save me anyway. You're wrong. You're wrong. Jesus said it, and I've said it many times. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. The person who keeps my commandments, that is the one that loves me. In other words, let's do the, 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 the inverse of that. If you don't love me, don't keep my commandments. So let's not be foolish and let's not lie to ourselves. If you're not doing what the word of God says, you better be careful that you are a servant of God, that you are a child of God. You might not be and you might have fooled yourself into thinking that you are. And me too. So be very careful of how you live your life and then claim the Lord. Because I noticed that we will claim the Lord when there's no danger involved. 
when it's easy to claim God, when it's part of the public sphere. But what about when it's unpopular? Do you still claim God? Well, we should. He's telling us, verse 13, again, put on the full armor. Now, he told us that about three times now. So that you can stand your ground. In other words, the armor is going to help you to stand your ground. And after you've done everything else, that's important. And after you have done everything to stand, he's telling us to take a stand on the things of God. And now he's going to bring it, break it down. Stand firm then. He says it again. Now, if something is repeated in the Bible three or four times, you better pay attention because God is speaking. He's telling us to stand firm, not to buckle down. Not to be scared, not to cut and run. He's telling us to stand. Therefore, but we already got there. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Somebody want to tell me what truth is? What is truth? Now I put all of these words in the in the chat when I first did the started the study. What is truth? You give me a short version. What is truth? I'll make it easy for you. It's the opposite of what? I'm giving you guys a moment to answer. What is truth? Thank you. Maria put it there. <laughs> the truth is the opposite of the lie, of a lie. The truth is reality, not my reality or not your reality. Thank you, Lauren. The opposite of lies. You know how many people talk about, well, I'm going to give you my truth. Nobody cares about your truth. The truth is the truth is the truth. There's not my truth and your truth. There's only the truth. Now, if you talk about, well, I feel this way. Okay, well, you might feel that way. Somebody else doesn't feel that way. But when did our feelings become the truth? Our feelings are not the truth. Our feelings are whatever we feel. And you know what? If it's a nice and beautiful and sunny day, you might feel fantastic. And if it's a dreary and sad day, you might feel down, dreary, and sad also. We have to understand. Uh, Lauren says truth is living according to his word. That's very good. And we're going to come back. To, to the word, what that means. Where was I? So the, the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Now, the belt that a Roman soldier wore, and this is where Paul gets some of these examples from, was a huge belt. Think of Batman's belt. Oh, and Lauren makes a good point here. Perspective is different from the truth. It absolutely is. We can all have different views, but there's only one, there's only one truth. Think of Batman's belt, right? His utility belt. He has all these things on it. He has the, the bat rope and the, the bat cuff and, and the bat toothpick, whatever he has on the bat belt. It's a million things. I don't know how he could carry that big thing. So fine. He has his utility belt and all these things on it. Well, on the belt that the Roman soldier wore, everything else eventually would become attached to that or surround that. So first of all, you and I, need to stand firm with the truth the belt of truth buckled around your waist we need to stop lying we need to say the truth we need to live the truth we need to breathe the truth we cannot deny the fact that we are believers of god and we should not deny that fact we need to walk the way we talk if i say i am a christian then the way I conduct myself must demonstrate that I am a Christian at all times. It doesn't matter where I'm at. I could be at a party. I am going to be a Christian at that party. I could be at the beach. I am going to be a Christian at the beach. I'm at the pool. I am going to be a Christian at the pool. I'm at the bar. Really? You're going to be a Christian at the bar? Think about it. You see what I'm saying? You got to walk with the truth at all times.
And this is listed first. Truth. The truth buckled around your waist. You know, you ever seen bodybuilders, especially power lifters? They put on this huge belt around their waist that literally holds their gut in so that things don't pop out when they're lifting these massive amounts of weight. We need to have the truth buckled around our waist to such a degree that we should get nauseous when we lie. It should be sickening to us to say something that is not true. So first of all, the belt of truth buckled around the waist. Then the breastplate of righteousness in place. Now the breastplate, well, it's the breastplate. It, it, it protects the chest area, the breasts. That is there so that if you if someone hits you there, if a blow comes there, it is going to take the hit for you. It is protecting. Now, what is righteousness? Righteousness, simply put, is right living. It is honoring of God. It is, it is doing what is correct. Part of it is being holy, which means separated for God, being just. In other words, moving away from things that are incorrect in doing to uh, uh, other individuals. But righteousness is speaking about seeking what is right in all areas, even if it's not to our benefit. That's righteousness. So you got the belt of truth around your waist. You have the breastplate of righteousness. It's covering all of this area because it would go pretty high up to the neck and down your chest and down your belly and over the belt. With the best breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. That's important. Very, very important. The gospel of peace. What Paul is telling us is that our shoes, our shoes, right? Shoes we wear. In other words, he's talking about our walk with those shoes should be to spread the gospel every opportunity we have. Now, what that means is, it's not that you're walking around and telling people, hey, you're gonna go to hell. Jesus came and he's coming again. And if you don't serve him, you're gonna go to hell. No, it means that the way you speak, the way you do your job, the way you conduct yourself breathes the fact that you love Jesus. You walk in a manner that people may approach you and say, hey, listen, what, what is this that you have that, that, that you don't get flustered? Now, you might get flustered, but you just don't show it, right? You keep it on the inside because self-control is part of what the Holy Spirit has given us. And then you have an opportunity to speak of the love of Jesus. See, when it says here, your feet fitted, in other words, the, your shoes don't fit me and my shoes uh, don't fit you. It's individual, your feet are fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. You are always ready to give the gospel of peace. In other words, that Jesus Christ came to reconcile man with God. He's the mediator. That's the gospel of peace. We can tell people, you're living in turmoil. Let me talk to you about the Prince of Peace, one of the titles of Jesus Christ in Isaiah chapter uh, 9. See, when you and I, Live a peaceful life. You know what? People want that. When you and I live a disordered and chronically problematic life, people don't want to be around us except to hear the gossip. People don't like that. There's too much of that in this world. And as Bible-believing Christians, we have to demonstrate the peace of, of God. So that was number three. We got the belt of truth around your waist. We got the breastplate of righteousness in, in place right there. And then your feet, they're fitted with the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, verse 16, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Think about that. Anybody want to give me a short definition of faith? What is faith? What is faith? We all have faith. But what is it? What does it mean? Hebrews 11.1 1 talks to us about that. But, but that's the, 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 the extended version. Give me, a, give me a short version. Takers. 
What is faith? Ah, oh, Eddie has a good uh, answer there. Believing in, in him who can do all things. That's excellent. Yes, that is, that is absolutely, that is faith. Hebrews chapter 11 breaks it down to an incredible degree. Hebrews 11, 1 says, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. You believe that? I am certain that God exists. Although I have never seen God. Well, Maria said it well. Trust in he whom we can't see. Now, that, does, that, that, that doesn't mean that, that it's blind faith. Because you are believing spiritually, you have that vision, that God does exist. And that he will reward you, the book of Hebrews says, because of your belief. But we're sure. We, as a matter of fact, we're willing to give our lives, as millions of people have done, in honor of God. Now, so now he says, take in verse 16, take up the shield of faith. So you have this massive shield and that shield had a bunch of hides, animal hides on it, and they would often wet it. So when the enemy would shoot arrows that were flaming, when it hit the shield, it could get stuck on the shield, but the water would extinguish the fire that was on the arrow. So, so you have the belt of truth around your waist. You have the breastplate of righteousness covering you from your neck all the way down. Then you have your shoes fitted to take the gospel of peace. Then take up the shield of faith. So you're holding the shield. Well, for what? With which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. In other words, your faith and my faith can conquer the attacks of the enemy because we are believing in the power of God to sustain us and to keep us safe. That's what God does. Now your faith has to be placed in God. Your faith cannot be in me because you know what? I'm going to fail you. And another man, that person is going to fail you. Your husband or your wife, they're going to fail you. Your son or your daughter, they're going to fail you. Your boss, they're definitely going to fail you. But what you have to see is that when your faith is in God, even if you die, you win. Because God is going to take you up to be with him. So take up the shield of faith. The shield of faith is going to help you extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Then take the helmet of salvation. So you put this big helmet on your head. The helmet of salvation. What does that do? Well, a helmet protects your head where our thoughts proceed from. Right? Our brain is encased inside of this, this hard um, skull. Why? Because our brain is very def uh, um, delicate. But from our brain, everything else functions. So if you have a brain injury, as I, I know people who have had, sometimes their body doesn't function the way it should. They want to go right, but they go left. Their limbs don't work correctly. All these things happen. But what Paul is telling us, that we have to take the helmet of salvation. When you have the helmet of salvation on, that means that you are utterly dependent on God who saves you. You know that it doesn't come from you. As a matter of fact, uh, when we're talking about um, holding, we often say hold on to God, that that's really incorrect. It is God who holds on to us. We're not even strong enough to hold on to him. Sometimes we don't even want to hold on. Thank God that he holds us and he keeps us safe. And then, so you put on the helmet of salvation. And the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And we're gonna, I'm going to close with that in a second. So what happens here? You have the belt of truth around your waist, the breastplate of righteousness covering you from your neck all the way down. Your feet are prepared to preach the gospel of peace. You have the shield of faith. You have the helmet of salvation. And then in your other hand, depends on which hand you use the most, the shield is on your left if you are righty. Um, you have the sword of the spirit in your hand. And what is it? Which is the word of God. You know what the word of God does? All you got to do is, is go to Jesus when he was being tempted by the devil. What did he do? He quoted three times from the book of Deuteronomy. Satan was quoting the Bible also. But Jesus defended the scriptures by letting the devil know. No, 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 no. The scriptures were not writing for me to tempt God. They were written for me to be able to battle you. And 
at least three times Satan went against them. It was probably much more. Three times are listed uh, in, uh, in one of the Gospels. But what we see is that every time the enemy came with a word to disturb Jesus, Jesus knew the word of God and the correct interpretation, and he threw it back at the devil. You know what our problem is? Because we don't read the Bible. We don't know the Bible. When the devil comes with a lie, we get fooled. And too many people are in cults in these religions that are dragging them to hell because they don't read the Bible for themselves. They depend on a minister or a pastor to read the Bible to them. Don't do that. I'm not saving you. As a matter of fact, I can take you to hell. Don't do that. You need to read the Bible for yourself. Don't trust what I say on Sunday. Don't even trust what I'm saying now. You need to have the Bible in your hands. You need to read the Bible. You need to go into commentaries. Go to Bible Gateway. There's 150 versions of the Bible in English for free. But what do we do? We have so much time on our hands that we don't have time to pray. We have so much time in our hands that we don't have time to read the Bible. We have so much time in our hands that we don't have time to do the things that honor God. But boy, we got time for everything else. Summer's coming, right? Even online, people are going to be absent from church in the summer. Because, you know, they got to be hanging out. I don't get it, but that's okay. Um, I guess I'm different in that way. But what we need to understand is God is telling us. God is telling us that if we don't have an understanding of his word, in that last section there, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, we're going to always fall for the lies of the devil because he's going to give us a Bible verse and add a little lie to it. He's going to spice it up. He's going to do like he did to Adam and Eve. Did God really say? And we're going to be like, oh, I don't know because I don't know the Bible. And we're going to be fooled. So get into the word of God. So that you can understand it. And then, so you got all these things on. You got the belt of truth around your waist. The breastplate of righteousness from your neck down to, to, your, to your legs. You have your feet with the ready, uh, shod fitted with the gospel uh, of peace. Prepared to give the gospel of peace. Then you have the shield of faith. Then you have the helmet of salvation on your head. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And finally, verse 18. And pray in the spirit on all occasions. In the spirit. You know what that means? Pray with the spirit of God alongside you. What does that mean? That means that when you come down to pray, wherever you pray, you are waiting for God's spirit to join you. And together you come before God. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers. All kinds of prayers and requests with this in mind. Be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Amen? I know that was a lot. If you have any questions or comments, you can put them there in the chat um, right now because we are coming to a close. But the point of all this is that God has prepared armor for us. Are we, are we choosing to wear that armor of God? Or are we falling for every lie of the enemy? Listen. One of the tasks that I have taken upon myself, oh, and remember, you can put anything in the chat there, questions or, or comments. One of the tasks that I've taken for myself is to study the human mind in the, in the doctorate that I'm doing. And we are incredible. We can make ourselves believe lies. Right now I'm studying about um, recovered memories and repressed memories and faulty memories and re memory recovery therapy and all of that. Boy, we can fool ourselves into believing things happened that didn't happen. And we got to be very careful about that because there are people that are going to lie and say this and this and this and this and this and we need to be prepared with the word of God to be able to defend ourselves. Amen? Being that there are no uh, comments or questions or anything, God bless you all. It's been my pleasure to be with you this evening. Sunday morning, 11 o'clock, we will be in church again, praising the Lord right here. You'll see me with a tie this Sunday. Um, honoring God, loving God, asking God to have mercy upon us. I pray that, that you have been blessed by this study, that you be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Make sure that you are focusing on the things of God, not on the things of your mind, 
the things of my mind, but that you are fully focused. Read this again when you have an opportunity. Ephesians chapter 6. <clears throat> There's a little bit more before this section. A little bit more, <clears throat> excuse me, after this section. And Paul really breaks down what's going to keep us stable in a world that's shaking. Well, God bless you all. I will see you Sunday.